So a warm welcome from Cambridge. I'm Henry Crucial from Wiki. Um, the session that you are listening to is multi-phase free, and I would like to welcome our first speaker, uh, Dr. Julian Meish, and he will talk about CFD modeling of complex subsurface processes. Great. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Julien. I'm a research fellow at Watch University. I came here today to talk about modeling subsurface processes with open form. And uh, first, I want to do a quick history of CFD for geosciences because uh, traditional CFD, by this I mean solving Navier-Stokes, uh, is relatively uh, recent in the geosciences, 20 years, not much more than that. Uh, and before that, numerical simulation were focused on solving transport in kilometer scale reservoirs. Um, this we call uh, reservoir simulations, and um, it has really different changes with heterogeneities, wells, fault, uncertainties. And because of that, many dedicated solvers uh, were built with Schlumberger and the CMG in Canada being the, um, the leaders in the field. And to do those simulations, you need several Darcy scale properties, so permeability K, relative permeability KR, and the capillary pressure PC. And this, those properties are normally obtained by performing experiments on uh, core samples. So these are centimeter scale cylinders, um, and we uh, do flow experiment on them. Uh, but then the advent of 3D uh, X-ray imaging uh, have revolutionized that, because now we can perform CFD simulations directly within the pore space of those rocks, and potentially calculate those Darcy scale properties. So what are the challenges um, related to CFD for geosciences? Uh, so first, as you can imagine, we have really complex domain. Um, and more importantly, um, no two rocks are the same at that scale, uh, which means we need an automatic way to build a mesh that will uh, fit the pore surfaces. And this is the first reason why we like open form, thanks to the Snappy X mesh uh, utility. Then we have complex geochemical interactions. Uh, for example, in, during CCS, uh, CO2 will dissolve in the water, creating a carbonic acid that may dissolve the rocks. Um, and uh, to solve these reactions, geochemists like using Frixi, the um, US Geological Survey geochemical solver, uh, which is really easy to link uh, with open form. So it's reason number two why we like open form. Um, and this CCS problem is a multi-phase reactive transport problem. And today, there is no CFD cap packages capable of solving this directly. They need to be extended somehow. And this is another reason why we like open form, uh, because the multi-phase flow is based on the algebraic volume of fluid method, which is really easy to extend to uh, multi-phase reactive transport. Uh, however, another specificity of this uh, CCS problem is that it occurs at very low capillary number, lower than 10 minus 5. If you're familiar with this uh, type of problems, you will know that the algebraic Wolf method suffers from a well-known problem called uh, parasitic currents, which prevents you from getting a, um, a um, an accurate velocity fields. There are other methods that are um, uh, better at dealing with low capillary number, for example, the geometric Wolf method, but then when you apply them to such complex geometries, they also fail. Uh, so the reality of that is that there is no robust solution currently, and uh, algebraic Wolf method is still the most popular one. Um, the last um, specificity is that micro CT images are very often multi-scale with poles uh, orders of magnitude different in sizes. And this I will uh, go into more detail at the end of the presentation. All right, so let me give you two examples. Uh, in this one, we inject water into viscous oil in a um, micro model representing a porous medium um, and observe viscous fingering. Uh, we can compare to an experiment that was done uh, at the MIT. This was part of a benchmark on a numerical method in which we participated 
uh, using open form. The second example, uh, we inject acid in a 2D micromodel representing a um, uh, carbon network, and we observe mineral dissolution and the formation of what we call a wormhole. And we can do this in uh, 3D, in uh, micro CT images too. Uh, here we're looking at how the Peclet number is uh, leading to different dissolution regimes. Uh, but today I want to focus on multi-phase reactive transport, and I want to be able to do this kind of simulations with relatively simple geometry. This is one channel and a pore cavity where we have gas trapped in it, uh, but a lot of coupled multi-physics. So what we have here is interface dynamic, interface transfer that may lead to local volume change. Um, if you have interface transfer, you will change the composition of the water, so you might have chemical reactions. And finally, I want to be able to do this in a multi-scale uh, domain with porous major interaction. So what do I need to add <coughs> to open form in order to be able to do this? Well, first, I want accurate modeling of interface dynamic. And of course, this is going to be at low capillary numbers, uh, so there will be a lot of parasitic current. I would like to remove them, but uh, I don't know how. So uh, for now, I'm just going to ignore this and hope that they don't damage my solution. Um, then I need accurate modeling of interface transfer. This I will have to add to the code. Chemical reactions, I will do this by linking with Frixi. I want a multi-scale, multi-phase model. Uh, this is uh, a current research question. I'm going to say a few words about that at the end of the presentation. And finally, I don't want this to take forever, so I want a fast and robust solver for multi-phase flow. And today I'm going to focus on problem number two and problem number five. So quick uh, recap of the Wolf method. When you have a, a multi-phase system, you have two sets of Navier-Stokes equations, one in each phase, communicate at the interface by a set of boundary conditions. And the principle behind the volume of field method is to model this in terms of um, the uh, indicator function of each, phases, of each phase and use volume averaging in each control volume. And if you do this, you will obtain the phase advection equation and the single field two-phase Navier-Stokes equation. Then if you also have a species, you will have two sets of advection diffusion equation, one in each phase, that communicate at the interface by a set of boundary conditions. Uh, here it's continuity of fluxes and uh, continuity of chemical potentials, which I express here using Henry's law. Um, and the principle behind this continuous species transfer method is to model the concentration in terms of its single field value uh, and then apply volume averaging. And we've uh, demonstrated in our uh, paper in chemical engineering science 2018 that when you do this, you obtain an advection diffusion equation with two additional terms, a convective term and a diffusive term. Um, the convective term is usually neglected because you are relative velocity can be neglected, um, but in open form, UR is replaced by a compressive velocity to limit the um, uh, numerical diffusion in the phase advection equation. Uh, and if you do that there, you have to do it here too. Otherwise, you will have um, artificial mass transfer. Um, then the diffusive flux is proportional to the gradient of alpha, which means it's only non-zero at the interface. And this is a term that will ensure that the concentration uh, jump at the interface is satisfied. So we can do this type of uh, simulation where we have uh, a species in the injected phase that cross the interface and diffuse in the resident phase. We can do this in micro CT images. So this is a three millimeter sample of pen timer sandstone uh, filled with oil and we inject water. So here, no species in the water cross the interface, which is actually the hardest case, uh, but the water reacts with the for surfaces, so we get sorption and desorption, and uh, we change the pH of the water. Uh, and the objective of this study is to upscale this to the Darcy scale, so we can do larger scale simulation. This is explained in detail in our uh, transporting porous media paper. So, so far, I've only considered diluted species, which means that uh, transfer doesn't impact the phase fraction. Uh, but if you uh, your gas is pure, for, for example, for example, CO2, uh, when it crosses the interface, it will lead to local volume change. 
and we've uh, uh, demonstrated in this paper in Journal of Computational Physics 2020 that if the solvent in the liquid phase does, doesn't cause the interface, then we can calculate the total mass transfer and re-inject it in the uh, continuity and the phase advection equation. Uh, note that I divide by alpha here so that the total mass transfer is not just equal to the sum of all diffusive flux across the interface. This is because when you display the interface, you will create an advective flux um, that you need to take into account. So this model is validated by comparison to um, uh, analytical solution in 1D, which we match perfectly, you can see in red. In blue is what we obtain if we don't divide by alpha. So you, need, you can see we need to do it. Um, we also validated by comparison to some medical solution for the dissolution of a rising bubble in 3D, and again, we obtain a good match. So now we have everything we need to perform a simulation like I want to do. Um, and to validate, I want to do an experiment too. In my lab, we use a 3D printing to create a um, porosity model. Uh, so we produce this, uh, fill it with CO2, then we inject water uh, at a flow rate of 0.01 meter per minute. So this corresponds to a capillary number of 10 by 6 and a packet of um, 104. So this means we are very capillary dominated, but also very advection dominated. This is uh, um, um, animation of the simulation. So we can compare with the experiment. So the red band, so this is the volume of the um, bubble. The red band is, um, is uh, uh, experimental uncertainty. So you can see we we fit well into it. It's not perfect, so we need to diverge at the end, but uh, it's a very good result. Quite happy with it. Then, um, if we connect this to Frixi, we can calculate the concentration of um, dissolved species in the water. As you can see, we have a very poor mixing uh, with a totally different concentration map before and after the cavity. Uh, so this, of course, will impact the way we upscale this to the Darcy scale because of the poor mixing. Uh, and this is explained in detail in our transport and post major paper. Right, so I can do the simulations, but the problem is that they're very slow. So this one here, uh, it takes three days of CPU time to run three minutes. Um, and this is optimized in the number of processors. It's a small model anyway. That's not the problem. The problem here is a time step, right? Um, because, uh, so when you use traditional piezo, um, you have you, the capillary forces are treated with explicit time stepping, so you get two uh, stability restriction, the famous CFL number associated to the velocity of the fluid. We like this one. We want to do simulation with a CFL between 0.1 and 1 because it's associated with the global time scale of the uh, system. And then you also have the break build condition associated with the um, the velocity of capillary waves. And the problem with this one is that it doesn't depend on the velocity. So when you add very low capillary number, you have a break bill number orders of magnitude larger than the CFL. So in this example, break bill is one, CFL is 10 minus four. So this means that we are doing 1,000 times more time steps that we would like to do. Um, uh, so this is why it's so slow. And to solve this problem, we've uh, developed a new time stepping strategy called uh, OSCAR, operator splitting with capillary relaxation. And the idea is to split the system in two steps, a viscous drag step where we cancel the suppression force. Uh, so during this step, you will move away from capillary equilibrium. So of course, this here is an exaggeration. Huh? I don't want to do such a large time step. I still want to do a time step with a CFL lower than one. Um, so then, we do capillary relaxation when we put back the suppression force, but we cancel injection. But because we are uh, away from capillary equilibrium, you will have uh, capillary waves, so the capillary relaxation step have to satisfy the break condition. And this means that at low capillary number, you will get, uh, for one viscous track step, you will have a large number N of uh, capillary relaxation steps, for example, 200. And if you perform those 200 steps, you will not get any speed up. Uh, but if you capillary dominated, they will converge way before that, like after 10 iterations, for example. So 200 divided by 10, you will get a speed up of 20. Um, so this we've uh, wrote in a paper, it is on archive, uh, applied to several examples, and I want to show you this one today. 
Uh, this is my Commodore. We inject water in uh, dodecane. Uh, the cap number is 10 minus five. Um, and the simulation with piezo following the bright beam number uh, takes 165 hours um, and with Oscar 63. So, and you see the almost the same map and the error is very small. Um, and so the Oscar simulation is done with a CFL of 0.1. This corresponds to a bright bill uh, of 250. So for one um, viscous step, we perform 250, maximum 250 um, capillary relaxation. But they could converge before that. And the, here I plot how many iterations I have to do before convergence uh, at each time step. And you can see an average, the average, I um, converge after 99 iterations. So 39%, that's why I get a 2.5 iteration, right? Um, so you can see uh, in the oscillator, it's quite oscillatory, and I can see I have two different modes of, it, of oscillation, right? I have a low frequency mode, which I think it's due to real capillary um, relaxation when you have different entry pressure, when you invade new pores, and then you have quite fast iteration, which I think comes from sparse currents, and if you clean this, you will get an even better uh, speed up. And sometimes, for some case, case with, for example, with a very large um, um, density ratio, you have too much post current and it's never converging. And you, so we still work on trying to work on this to solve that. It doesn't work in every case, but it, it works perfectly for those cavity because it's almost quasi static there, right? The interface will just go down due to the diffusion. Um, uh, so we can do it in, instead of uh, three days, it takes six hours. It's actually longer too. Um, uh, this time. And we can do another simulation when we divide the flow rate by 10. So you can see on the left, the original uh, model, it's the dissolution is very um, transfer limited. The CO2 crosses the interface and is almost uh, automatically flushed out of the system until it goes quite low in the cavity. Uh, so this is why at first the evolution of the, sorry, this is the size of the bubble. So it's a, you see something. Uh, it's almost a straight line, at least at first, until you start having diffusion effects. Uh, when you divide the flow rate by 10, um, so a capillary number 3 minus 7 now, um, PECLE 10.4, and uh, so we moving away to more transport limited when the CO2 hangs around a little bit longer at the interface between before being flushed out, and that's why it's starting to turn way before uh, the previous one. So this, of course, we can only do thanks to our uh, by numerical simulation, thanks to our OSCAR method. Right, so before I conclude, uh, I want to say a few words about multiscale. This at the bottom left is a fractured micromodal. It's, uh, it's 3D, but with a very small depth, and it's quasi 2D. Uh, this model is 2,000 by 2,000 by six voxels, and we simulate the transport of a dye. We, by the way, we have an experiment uh, of this that will match perfectly, um, of a dye, and we see the two different time scales. Uh, in the fracture and in the matrix. This simulation takes several hours to do, and to save on computational time, I want to use a multi-scale method. My multi-scale method will only have, would be 2D and only have 40 by 40 cells. And uh, to model the free solid interface in each cell, I will uh, characterize this by the local porosity epsilon. So this would be one in the fracture and a number between zero and one in the matrix corresponding to the porosity. Uh, then you can solve the flow using darcy brickman stokes equation. So it's basically Navier-Stokes with an additional Darcy resistance term. And this term will vanish in the fracture, so you get Navier-Stokes, and will be um, uh, dominant in the matrix, so you will get Darcy. Um, so when you, and uh, for, the t for the die, we use a volume average transport equation. Um, and when we do this simulation, it takes several seconds, and we get almost exactly the same result. Right. This is very popular in subsurface engineering because micro CT images are almost always multi-scale. Um, but then we need to extend this to multi-phase. And this is where we have a problem because we don't know how to connect capillary pressure inside the matrix to the surface tension force in the fracture. This is an unresolved problem. No one knows how to do this properly at the moment. So if you think you know how to do this, please uh, contact me. So this takes me to uh, my conclusions. Um, I hope I've convinced you that open form can be used to investigate these complex processes at the poor scale and beyond when you have multi-scale 
uh, images. All simulations you've seen today were performed with OpenFORM and our extension called GeochemForm, geochemistry for OpenFORM, uh, you can uh, download online. Uh, and I want to emphasize again that the crucial next step for us is to extend this to multi-scale DBS to multi-phase. Uh, so thank you for your attention. Um, and if you have any questions, I'd be very happy to answer them. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I think I will start with the audience. There is a question here. I'll come with the mic and I'll come back to our um, offline, uh, online audience later. I have, don't see any questions here. So please type. Yeah, thank you very much for a nice talk. I really enjoyed it. It, it brought back some memories of the work I did with Stefan Fleckenstein and, and where we had some hard points in the end. Yeah. So, so two questions. Uh, so one is if you have the water, it will typically also have dissolved gas in it or even other species, of course, but the dissolved gas, do you also think that in your right. application that would be relevant to have the conjugate transfer that the, the dissolved gas can also leave the water while so the, the CO2 goes inside? So the, sorry, the, the, we model the dissolution of the gas of the CO2 going in the water. What we do not model is the water going into the gas. I was uh, uh, saying the same assumptions that you guys did that the solvent doesn't go into. No, no, I don't, I don't mean the solvent. So inside the water, the water had contact with air. And, and, with and, and water has dissolved air typically in it. So there will be nitrogen, ah. oxygen in it. And then you uh, have in, this. In, yeah, in this case, I mean, we can do it. We can do okay. that too. That's not a problem. But in this case, the water is pure. It's been degassed before. To oh, okay. not just measure, but it could be a multi-component mixture in the uh, in the water. It so you could do that be. as well. Yeah, also with some the component uh -huh. may cross. Some component does don't cross. But the only assumption we have to make, which is not good, it's not correct, is that the water doesn't go into the gas. That's not correct. Yeah, I see. And we uh -huh. think I think it's maybe why, in my. Uh, in my uh, uh, this at the end, it start diverging. I think we have water in the CO2. That's why I'm mm -hmm. not sure of that. But. And then a second one that is really very open question. So I don't have answers myself at the moment. So if you want to really capture also long time behavior, you have to make sure that you treat pressure in a thermodynamically consistent way. I mean, you had the Henry law the, and, yeah. and, and chemical potentials are extremely uh, dependent on pressure. Yeah. And so also the, the gas phase, I think it should need uh, thermodynamics that is more appropriate for a gas phase and not just an incompressible fluid. So uh, do you have you thought about these things for yeah, the future? I mean, absolutely. So of course here, uh, because it's trade, the capillary pressure doesn't change much. So uh, we don't have this problem. But, uh, one of the things that is really important for subsurface processing is uh, osphere ripening when you have different bubbles uh, in porous media. Uh, and of course, there, the, because the size matter, the capillary pressure will change. We need to add this. So we need somehow to, to uh, the next step would be to, to uh, couple this with uh, compressive interform to be able to model that. Yeah, that's, that's okay. thank you for us. Okay, hello everyone. I am uh, Ben Said Musba, <coughs> a researcher at uh, the Center of uh, Research on Arid Regions. I am working on uh, the optimization of uh, uh, fluid control structures, mainly uh, not linear wares, such as labyrinth and uh, piano cavers. So this uh, presentation is about uh, numerical modeling of the flow over uh, the labyrinth wear by using uh, open flow. Here, an example of uh, the no, non-linear wear uh, uh, with the, the shape of trapezoidal. As we see here, it is uh, folded in the space to increase the, 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 the crest length and, uh, and that to increase the, the, the capacity of uh, discharge. This is a tra uh, traditional uh, labyrinth way. May I interrupt you for a good second? Um, you are not in presentation mode. We, we still see the first slide. Oh. Yeah. This is, it's okay. 
Mm -hmm. No, we see, still see the first slide with your uh, name on it. Uh, now we see the weir, the labyrinth weir. No, I think yes, you're good to go. Yes, yes, yes. Like this, yes, it's okay. Yes, it, now it's okay. No. Uh, this is another uh, type of uh, labyrinth weir, which is uh, recently developed. It's called uh, piano key weir. As, uh, uh, it's uh, shape uh, similar the, to the uh, piano, the inlet and the, the outlet and clean, and thus it's called the piano key wear. It's uh, it's high. Uh, it has uh, it has a very high performance compared to, to the traditional wear. So uh, in general, there are three uh, methods for increasing the, the capacity of spillway of dams by increasing the, the width of the crest of the spillway, or by lowering the crest elevation, or by using the uh, non-linear wear. Here, as example, pika wear. However, for the first case, the increase of the width of uh, the spillway can be sometimes not possible uh, for the site constraint or maybe results high 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 cost due to the, the construction extra construction or, or <clears throat> the second uh, case the lowering of uh, the crest elevation could be a result of uh, decreasing mag significantly the the storage capacity hence the non linear wear such as pika wear or uh, labyrinth wear could be useful uh, uh, alternative for increasing the capacity of the spillway or the storage capacity. <clears throat> it's, excuse me, um, we, yes. we still see your first picture. Ah, now we are, you are in full screen. That looks good. Oh, okay, it's good. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry. This is a, a simulation representing the, the performance of no linear wear compared to the linear wear. Here we can see for the same width of spillway and the same discharge uh, rate discharge, the pika wear can reduce the upstream head by three to four times compared to linear wear. It means that we can increase the capacity of the discharge by three to four times compared to the linear wear. Uh, here, the traditional uh, labyrinth wear, generally there are three uh, kind of uh, labyrinth wear, trapezoidal, uh, rectangular, and uh, triangular. However, the traditional labyrinth wear could not be used for uh, concrete dams due to the extra uh, large of uh, its uh, footprint. Uh, hence, um, for that, uh, the, our laboratory and uh, in collaboration with Hydrocop uh, France, developed this uh, type of wear called pika wear for adapting or for use to the, uh, over the crest of the concrete uh, crest dams. <clears throat> the object, objective of this, uh, this, uh, this research is to evaluate in the entrance effect uh, on the performance of labyrinth wear, also the, the, the effect of the geometry of the inlet and outlet of the labyrinth uh, on the performance of labyrinth. The numerical uh, the model was um, validated uh, against the experimental model uh, co conducted at the experimental station at the University of Biskra in condition in channel condition in channel with the dimension of uh, 12 meter length uh, by one meter wide and by what one meter depth. This is the characteristic of the uh, tested models. All models have the same uh, dimensions, uh, except the, the entrance uh, shape or the presence of the uh, slope at the inlet or outlet. Here, an example of the flow over the tested model in the experimental station. Uh, here, uh, a comparison between the, the computed and the tested model. Uh, this picture shows the capability of the 
of the firm to reproduce the flow over the uh, labyrinth way. The top uh, picture shows the the uh, the view uh, from the downstream, and the bottom at the bottom shows the uh, view of uh, the upstream of the flow. <coughs> However, for reducing the uh, the cost of uh, competition and the uh, time of the competition, we have used only one cycle of uh, labyrinth or uh, the model. The dimension of the competition domain uh, is uh, 2.6 meter by 15 uh, centimeter by 38 centimeter. We, are, we have used the interferon as a solver and um, the K-epsilon turbulence model as a model of the turbulence. Uh, the domain uh, was discretized by the block mesh and snappy hex mesh, uh, which uh, leads to, to, to uh, a round of uh, 170,000 cells uh, of uh, cells. <clears throat> Here, the comparison between the computed and the tested model uh, shows the accuracy is about, uh, in average, about 5%. For the first uh, simulation, we have used uh, two models to test the entrance effect on the performance of labyrinth, where the first one is with rounded entrance and the second one with flat entrance. The results have shown that the rounded uh, entrance it provides high performance compared to the labyrinth with flat entrance. The difference between the performance is about 5% for all the tested upstream head. <clears throat> also, the surface, 3D surface of water was extracted, and it is shown that, um, that the labyrinth with rounded entrance has a slightly a uh, high level of uh, surface water compared to the rectangular labyrinth wave. This means that the rounded entrance provides high uh, performance of the way. Here the streamlines shows the, the flow over the waves. For the rounded entrance, we can observe the smooth flow over the wall of the water. However, for the rectangular labyrinth with flat entrance, we can see the contraction of the flow. This, this, this uh, contraction uh, decreases the uh, contribution of the crest, uh, where, as we see here, only uh, half six of the section of the wear is contributed uh, in the performance of labyrinth. However, for the rounded entrance, Almost of all the crests have uh, contributed in the performance of the labyrinth. Also, for uh, testing the geometry of the inlet and outlet on the performance of labyrinth, five models were tested. <clears throat> the first one is the Kawer, the second one without inclination, the third one is only uh, outlet inclination, and uh, other one only with inlet inclination, and the last one with inlet and outlet inclination. The results have shown that um, the peak aware provides high performance compared to other uh, variant. The difference between the performance of uh, peak aware and the models with uh, sloped inlet is about 15%. 15 uh, about 15% 15, uh, 15 for the low head around the uh, HP equal to uh, 0 0.5. However, it is about 7% between the peak aware and the uh, labyrinth without uh, inlet slope. Also, the, the surface of water was extracted for the models. We can see here for the models with the um, inlet slope are poorly uh, supplied with water. Also, we can see here uh, the, the development of submergence of flow at the outlet of the, 
of the uh, labyrinth without uh, inlet slope. And only the picaware who provides uh, a good distribution of the flow over the, the crest. Here also we can see the uh, streamline. This streamline shows that uh, the, for the diverse, for the labyrinth with inlet slope, uh, this region has poor uh, contribution in the performance of the labyrinth compared to those uh, labyrinth. Uh, also, we can see here <coughs> for the models without inlet uh, uh, slope, only this part or, or this uh, section is contribute in the um, performance. And as we said, only the picaware who provides a good distribution of the of the um, of the the flow over its crest. Here, because mainly uh, the presence of the uh, overhang in that overhang, which uh, helps to uh, the flow to reach the crest uh, at the inlet, also the reduced section of the bottom of the model uh, have, have helped to the flow to reach the uh, uh, downstream uh, crest of the inlet. In, in addition, uh, the overhang at the outlet uh, enables to this model to reduce the submergence of uh, the crest here compared to this uh, two models where the development of the submergence was observed. As conclusion, the wear on trans shape significantly affects the discharge efficiency. The inlet geometry of the labyrinth has, has an important effect on the labyrinth efficiency. According to the uh, this findings of, the, this, of this study, the optimal arrangement for a hydraulic and structural point of view corresponds to the peak aware geometry. Good agreement was found between the physical and numerical results. The obtained results indicate that the numerical model is able to compute the discharge capacity of the test models of the rectangular labyrinth wear with mean average relative error of 5%. The numerical simulation using open form CFD helps to further analyze the rectangular labyrinth wear efficiency by providing important information about the flow behavior, such as, such as free surface profile and streamline, streamlines. The CFD a simulation can be a useful tool for analyze uh, and pre-design the labyrinth wear and helping to reduce the cost of the future uh, wear. And thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. So our next speaker is uh, Mr. Alexis Poupier. And uh, he will be presenting on numerical simulation of reactive Taylor flows. Can I flows is yours. Yes. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I'm Alexi, and we talk about uh, my PhD project about the simulation of reactive Taylor flows. So I will start by giving some context about the work so that you can understand what I'm dealing with. Then I will uh, give some um, details about uh, scientific approach I use. And I will show some results about the first hydrodynamic study I have conducted. Then we will uh, uh, dig into the mass transport and mass transfer, which is the, the very, very important part of the work. And I will try to draw some conclusions. So what is um, reactive Taylor flow? So a Taylor flow, as you can see at the bottom of the, of the slide, is a kind of flow where there are um, very big bubbles of uh, gas in comparison with the size of the channel. So the, the gas bubble is, uh, is filling almost entirely the, 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 the channel. And there, is, there are some liquid slug between the gas bubbles. So this kind of, uh, of flow is very interesting because it shows a high surface to volume ratio. And it uh, consumes a um, low volume of reagents, which is important in chemistry. And it also provides a good mixing between the liquid in the liquid slugs. So what is the application of the work? Uh, it is the, uh, the um, 
oligomerization reaction, which is uh, uh, represented in the at the middle of the slide, where you use ethylene to produce butane. And the uh, main objective is to uh, transpose the catalysis test from batch reactors, which are uh, non-continuous, to um, continuous flow microreactors. So uh, very, very small reactors of around 500 microns of diameter. So these kind of flows are very capillary and they show, uh, they, they have a very, um, a very strong surface tension force that will uh, create some numerical problems as we, can, we will see later. So what is the numerical method that I use? Um, so first for the um, numerical simulation of the uh, gas liquid flow, the advection of the interface is done with a VOF method. So in open form, there are two or three VOF solvers, uh, the interform, which is the uh, algebraic solver and the um, uh, interisoform using iso vector, which is the geometric option. So, um, the uh, the idea to to study the gas liquid reaction is to be able to model the mass transfer that will occur between the gas bubble and the liquid slugs. And to do so, we need to um, to add another equation to this uh, to this problem, which will represent um, let's say the concentration of a species. And then with the transport and the transfer of uh, this concentration, we will be, uh, with the, transfer, the transport of this concentration, we will be able to model the chemical reaction, which is in the end what we are interested in. So as you can see, to model the concentration, we use a classic advection diffusion equation. And then uh, we have to, of course, to uh, discretize this equation. And um, we have to, to do it in a consistent way with the uh, the uh, VOF equation, so with the uh, free surface, um, with the free surface. So there are basically two ways of uh, dealing with this kind of equation. You can choose to have um, a single field approach, which is uh, representing the concentration in the whole domain with only one field, and then there will be uh, this continuity at the interface. Or you can um, you can use two fields which uh, will stand for the gas and the liquid phase, meaning that uh, the field will be set to zero in the other phase in, in order to, to, to stay uh, consistent with the phase fraction. So for both uh, approaches, there are several um, important issues. First, we, we have to stay consistent. When I say consistent with the interface, it means that if we want the, to follow the concentration, we we have to make sure that it stays in the right phase uh, and uh, there, that, that there is no artificial mass transfer. And we also have to take care of the diffusivity as it is a, an advection diffusion equation. Um, there is diffusive fluxes and in the uh, free surface advection equation uh, used in VOF, there is no diffusion uh, operator. So we have to make sure that uh, they will not be um, they will not have inconsistency because of the diffusion at the interface. So in our case, we, we have chosen to work with a geometric buff as we as we as as I will talk about later. And uh, then we will use a two fields approach because it is uh, it is much more um, easy to use it with a VOF uh, geometric VOF. So the the, the, hydro, the hydrodynamic study is of course the first um, the first step of uh, of the simulation. So I started to to verify if uh, if the uh, VOF solvers in open form are able to simulate the Taylor flows. And uh, what I was looking at was, for example, bubble characteristics such as the length or um, the film thickness, the shape of the bubbles, and of course the velocity uh, and the, the spurious currents and the the spurious velocities that arise from the surface tension. So I have did a lot of uh, hydrodynamic simulations with uh, a coaxial injector, which is uh, a, where you can create bubbles and uh, the, the, the liquid, the gas injector is inside and the liquid injector is outside, a T-junction where you can uh, also produce bubbles, but it's, um, no, yes, a T-junction. And then I, I've tried, um, straight channels and periodic conditions. So what has um, uh, was 
what I have concluded from this hydrodynamic study is that uh, with uh, very highly capillary flows, interform has some uh, some issues. So what you can see on the on the figure on the picture is a coaxial injector, where at the bottom uh, in gray there is the the gas bubble growing, and at the top in in uh, in pink the the liquid flowing. So the bubble is uh, is uh, is growing at the center and you can uh, you can see blue um, in blue the um, some liquid fractions that appear at the uh, at the axis so this is a, a 2d axisymmetric case and so this is the the axisymmetry uh, the axis and uh, when the bubble is growing there are there is some some liquid fraction which is non zero that is um, gathered at the axis and this is uh, because of the of the computation of the surface tension force. So the the interface is uh, step by step uh, thickening, and then some strange, some let's say spurious bubbles or droplets appear at the axis because of the of the miscalculations of the surface tension force. So this is a real issue in my case. I've found these uh, results also with the simulation in a T-junction. So it is a very uh, bad issue because when you have um, this kind of small droplets and bubbles, there is an interface that is uh, supposed not to be not there. And then there will be fluxes at this interface. So it is, it is really bad. Um, I've also had some strange results about uh, the, 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 the release of the bubble. So this is a... Um, a picture of um, a case in a T junction where I've refined the mesh a lot of times, a lot of time to conduct a mesh sensitivity analysis. And what I found is that when you refine too much your, your mesh, the bubble is not released anymore. So the um, I have not found yet what, what the uh, the reason of that. Um, but I'm trying to to take a look at the boundary condition. Uh, especially on the gas channel right here, and because um, it is an incompressible flow and it might have an impact on the release of the bubble. So let's talk about the, the interesting part, which is the, the mass transport. So um, the first step of, um, of, the, of the resolution is to discretize the advection diffusion equation, so, so the one at the top. And you use uh, the classic finite volume uh, method to uh, to use the Green Ghost theorem to represent the fluxes at the at the faces of your of your cell. And doing doing that, you you will need the phase values of uh, the velocity, the concentration, um, to be able to uh, update uh, your concentration with the uh, advection operator. So what you what you will need is a, a method. To, um, to be able to interpolate the concentration from the cell centers onto the cell faces. And as you can, uh, you can remember from what I've said before, this uh, method methodology should be, must be consistent with the, uh, the one that is used in the advection of the volume fraction. Otherwise, there will be, there will be some uh, differences, some discrepancies between your concentration field and the interface that will lead to an artificial mass transfer. So we have another issue there. Um, so as I said before, interform was not um, satisfactory. So we have decided to use inter So especially iso vector. And in iso vector, it, it is um, a geometric buff, meaning that the uh, advection is done explicitly. There is no... Um, um, interpolation coefficients that are uh, computed from the uh, owner and neighbors. So we we don't have uh, this, uh, we, we cannot mimic what is done with iso vector in terms of implicit uh, advection operators. So I, I had to find another way to, to make my interpolation in order for it to be consistent with iso vector. So what I've done is that um, I've separated my concentration field in two, uh, in two cases, so if there is no interface in the cell, then I can use a, a classic interpolation scheme that is a, that is already present in the form because there won't be uh, in open form because there won't be any uh, any inconsistencies with the interface. But if 
On the other hand, I am in a cell where uh, there is the interface. I have to be sure that the fluxes on the faces of this cell are proportional to the one uh, computed, computed by isoad vector. So to do so, I use a, a, a small scaling law uh, to ensure that the phase value of my concentration is, uh, is indeed proportional to the alpha, um, so the, the volume fraction on the faces. The volume fraction on the faces represent how much uh, of the face is immersed in the liquid. And it shows, um, in a way, how the interface is uh, oriented in the cell. So this method is, uh, is interesting because you can use it both uh, to advect a, uh, a, a scalar that is uh, exactly the same as, a, as alpha, as the, as the volume fraction field. And it's also interesting because you can use it uh, in an, a kind of implicit uh, way when you, you do not want to, um, to specify the concentration and you can, you, you can just Con, uh, add vector random concentration, which is what we want with the mass transfer, because we don't know the, the concentration before mass transfer. So on, on this, uh, on this uh, picture, you can see the comparison between three, uh, three schemes. And the idea is to compare the advection of a classic bubble, um, of a classic bubble, Taylor bubble in a channel. What I've said before is that we, uh, we, we must have con uh, consistency between our equation and the alpha equation. And, and what does it mean? It means that there is no concentration of the liquid phase that is flowing in, inside into the, the gas phase. Because we have two concentration fields, we must ensure that there, they, there is no artificial mass transfer in the way that um, um, the advection flows uh, the concentration in the wrong phase. So at the top, there is the classic upwind uh, interpolation scheme, which is very diffusive, as we know. So it does not preserve the EV side uh, distribution of the bubble. Uh, then there is a second order scheme using the Van Niels limiter, which is a kind which is better, as we can expect. And at the, the bottom, there is my uh, my custom scheme that I've presented before. Uh, that is uh, much better because it does preserve the uh, concentration field. So this concentration field is initialized exactly as alpha, uh, is exactly as the volume fraction field. And with a, a consistent advection operator, I should be able to, to move it in the same way as the interface. And that is very important for the, for the rest. So I'm very happy with the result of this custom scheme because we, we can see that we do uh, we are indeed um, very consistent with the concentration. So after this uh, this advection part, I've modified the the computation of the diffusion coefficient in order to for it to be uh, zero in the uh, in the on on the faces of the cell cut by the interface, so that there is no uh, inconsistencies. And um, what you can see here is the complete advection diffusion equation that is consistent with alpha. So once uh, I've uh, kind of validated the mass transfer, the important part is the, the, the mass transport, the important part is to add a volumetric system that will uh, uh, make the transfer between the, the two phases of the, for the species. So how to do it? We, we need to find the interface and compute a flux, a diffusive flux at this interface based on the concentration gradient and a, an effective diffusivity. And we approximate this um, this constant this gradient as the the mean gradient at the interface and the surface of the interface. So um, mm, we also use a uh, Henry's law to be able to um, to make the concentration uh, jump between the two faces, and um, then we will uh, use limiters. Uh, to be sure that uh, the concentration does uh, does respect the Henry's law, and uh, then with the uh, with the local uh, equilibrium, we can compute the, the the direction of the flux between the two phases. So this is the first results I've obtained. So in this uh, on, on this uh, picture, you can see a rising bubble in a in a qui in a quiescent liquid. So there is um, the what you see here is the concentration of the liquid phase, meaning that the, 
the concentration at the beginning of the simulation was zero everywhere. And if there is concentration in the liquid phase, it's because of the mass transfer. Uh, and then when the bubble is moving, the, the flow around the bubble um, moves the concentration. So this is what you can see, those kind of vortex of, uh, of vortex uh, behind the, the, the bubble. Uh, what is important on this figure is uh, that you, with the custom interpolation scheme and the mass transfer, we still respect the uh, consistency and there is no, um, there is no, liquid concentration in the gas bubble, which is the most important thing if we want to deal with a two fields approach. And the other thing which is interesting is that the, the, the lower bound of the concentration, so this concentration is uh, not really a concentration, it's more like a, a molar fraction or a mass fraction. So it's supposed to be between zero and one. We can see that we have a, a very low around minus 11, uh, negative value, but this is because of the mass transfer, and this is imp important to to ensure that it is uh, very low indeed, because we we don't want to have um, to have issues with negative concentration and issues with conservation. So this is the first result, which is interesting. And then in uh, I've used my, uh, my my new my new solver to uh, to test what I'm inter interesting in which is the, the simulation of Taylor bubbles. And this is what you can obtain when you want to generate a Taylor bubble. Um, so what you can see on this figure, on this picture is the concentration in the liquid that is um, increasing because of the mass transfer from the gas toward the, the liquid. And you can see where the, the concentration will, will increase the most because of the local velocity and the local uh, concentration gradient. So this is important because then we can use this information to compute the chemical reaction. And of course we can, uh, for example, have, have some um, some feedback on the on the design of the reactors to ensure a good mixing, et cetera. So this, uh, this result is uh, interesting. And, and then the, what's the, what we come next is first the, so, so yes, yes. Uh, so, what I need to add now is the, the chemical reaction itself, which will be uh, using this uh, local concentration field uh, to produce another species that will also be advected, diffused with the same equation, uh, but with different uh, concentration, uh, diffusion coefficient, et cetera. So in, in our case, it's the butane, and we will be able to, um, to compare how the, uh, the, the different uh, catalysts work in, uh, in, in our simulation, for example, with the reaction rate, which is in fact what we are interested in. So what I, will, I want to say to conclude is that uh, uh, the simulation of very capillary flows, such as Taylor flows at a very um, a small, uh, small scale is difficult. First, because of course of the surface tension force, which has um, given me some uh, troubles, especially with, with interfoam. Then I've also had some issues with the mesh refinement uh, because of the liquid film. So I didn't talk about that, but between the gas and the bubble, there is a small liquid film, uh, which is around, um, in my case, around the size of the micrometer. So we, around five micrometers, and what we want is something like five cells to be able to, to, um, to compute the gradient. So we, we need the, some cells which are around one micrometer and, it makes it it, it makes uh, the mesh very huge. So we have a very uh, a huge mesh, which is uh, not a good idea, as I've shown with the the, the issue with the release of the bubble. Uh, and of course, with a very fine mesh, then you have this issue with the CPU time that can be very large. So uh, what I found with the transport and the cost of the concentration is that. Uh, making an equation consistent with the VOF and the advection of the free surface is uh, very difficult because you, you have to think about everything, uh, every fluxes, every phase value uh, that can be different will lead some to, to inconsistencies. And uh, finally, um, uh, the diffusive flux is a little bit more uh, easy to, to deal with and then I will take uh, the I will in, implement the reaction part, which is the I guess the the, the most uh, simple thing of the of this project. So 
thanks a lot for your attention. So if you have any question. Thanks. Thank you, Alexis. Um, are there any questions? Thank you for a very interesting uh, presentation. So you, you mentioned that you want to uh, implement the reaction in your uh, model as a, one of the next steps. So I'm curious, will these small negative concentrations that you're observing now, will they affect this reaction implementation in a, uh, in a big way? Because I can imagine that if you have a, a reaction that's, that's dependent on your liquid concentration and it's negative, then this will uh, be quite impactful. So, so the um, yes. So, if you if you think about the the concentration and the the um, the reaction rate, uh, I didn't put it there, but it's proportional to the concentration of ethylene. So, if it is negative, then you will have a negative uh, reaction rate. So, what you could do, uh, what I will try to do first is put something like a condition: don't put any reaction rate if the concentration is negative. And if I really want to uh, have something general, what we could uh, still do is cut out every negative concentration. So in this case, it was around minus 10. So it's okay because you make a small conservation error, but then if uh, the concentration somehow becomes around 10 minus seven and you have a lot of um, of cells where, where it happens, uh, it can lead to very uh, bad uh, conservation error. So the, 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 I think the most easy, the easiest part is to, to just condition the reaction rate to the sign of the concentration. And of course, my, my aim in the end is not to have these uh, negative values of concentration. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, first, a very short one for the question before. I mean, we also did this reactive mass transfer and, and clipping at zero was no problem for the, for the chemistry. I mean, Another problem was if you have several species and you want to have still conservation of molar mass, mm. you have to be very careful if you do it segregated one after the other, you are actually doing the same uh, reaction rate, but with different concentrations, because you already updated one variable and then you have a problem. Mm. So you have to be a bit careful about that one. Uh, my question is, if you have, uh, I, I think you already have some concentration boundary layer around that uh, makes it hard to uh, have enough resolution to really resolve it up to the interface. Probably I missed something. I, I missed the first minute, so I'm sorry for that. Are you dealing with realistic Schmidt numbers? And if you add the chemistry, the boundary layers will be coming even, even finer. And, and so you have even more resolution demand. Are you using some subgrid scale modeling or whatever technique to, to uh, go with realistic Schmidt numbers? Okay, so uh, in this in this case, I, I, do you mean that the yeah the, the the concentration looks very thick around the bubbles? So uh, in this case, first the mesh is not refined very uh, because I have some issues with parallelization. So this is a very coarse mesh to do uh, regular simulation times. I didn't check at the Schmidt numbers, and to be honest, these uh, these values of concentration are not. Uh, really realistic because I'm at the beginning of the computation of the diffusion gradient, etc. So the values may not be re realistic. So in the end, you you might have um, very very low concentrations, and uh, I I don't know. I'm not sure of. Uh, but I didn't look at the. Yeah, so it's just a hint, so to say. Uh, there is some subgrid scale modeling okay. applicable that that saves you quite some resolution demand. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. So, any more questions from the audience? No, that is not the case. So let's let's thank the speaker again. So our next speaker uh, will be online again. And it is Lorenzo Pedro Rolli, and he will present on an MP pick calibration of CFDD for multiphase gas metal powder flow in additive spectrum. Uh, 
Oh, there he is. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me in this virtual in virtual form. I'm glad that I, I'm, I'm able to present you some initial part of my work, even in this online uh, uh, manner. Uh, I'm at the first year of my PhD. I'm, as you can see, I'm Lorenzo Pedroli. Here you can see that there is my contact, and I'm studying at the University of Devsto in the Six Ideas Project which is an interdisciplinary European funded project within the Horizon 2020 bundle of projects. Um, second slide, there we go. Uh, my work is about laser metal deposition. And uh, here I, I am using open foam as a user in the sense that I'm trying to simulate the processes that are happening in this manufacturing technique. And laser metal deposition, as you can see from this first picture, is a, a manufacturing technique that uh, builds the parts layer by layer by the subsequent deposition of, uh, of layers, and the material is delivered in powder form. What I'm working on is the um, powder fixed feedstock delivery. As you can see, the machine has a um, relatively complicated um, equipment that is uh, used to take the materials from the storage canisters and and take it all the way to the uh, nozzle and to the and to the workplace uh, to the workpiece what i'm focusing on right now it is on the end of the nozzle so i want to see if there are some phenomena that i can predict using cfd dm simulation or mppsc simulation that can explain and then and that can model some of the uh, character of the surface characteristics that emerge from this uh, um, manufacturing uh, technique. As you can see, both from the, the left picture, the left picture, you can see that there are small islands that are uh, manufactured with the laser metal deposition, and you can see that there are some surface irregularities. There is a surface roughness, and on the right, you can see another image, which is from uh, from offer. And in the second image, you can see also that these walls have as well some surface irregularities. And I want to see if both coupled CFD, DM, and MPPIC can accurately predict the periodic phenomena in LMD equipment. I want to put a disclaimer here in the sense that the periodic flows might be just a small influence on this whole phenomena because there are many more uh, many more energetic effects at play. As you can imagine, there is a laser, there are uh, auxiliary gas flows, there, is the, there are the chemical reaction happening on the surface, uh, thermal effects, et cetera, that might also disturb in quite an in intense way the manufacturing process. But I think that the periodic phenomena are playing a part uh, the objective then for this first part is to compare two Eulerian Lagrangian methods, which are both present in the um, not the latest edition right now because they, they just came out with uh, Open Form 10. But I mean, in Open Form 9, there is uh, a CF, there is both uh, the possibility to simulate MPPIC particles and CFDDM particles. So I wanted to assess how they behave and understand what, what I can do with both of them. And uh, I wanted to do that through the analysis of a rele relevant problem for the system I'm, I'm analyzing, which is the investigation of the periodic flow phenomena in a pipe. Here I am showing you the uh, conveying pipe configuration. I'm showing you how the particles appear once they fill up the, the pipe. I, uh, I'm showing you how the particles um, occupy the mesh. And uh, the pipe is a horizontal pipe with a 1.25 diameter and uh, uh, with a diameter of 1.25 millimeters and a length of 50 millimeters. Uh, so it is a um, relatively thin pipe. Uh, the pipe contains in the order of uh, the thousands of particles. I put 10 to the 3, but it is between 1,000 and 10,000 particles. It is a collision dominated flow in the sense that with this number of particles, the concentration uh, of the particles allow the allow the collision. So the collisions are uh, um, relevant, but it is not a dense flow. It is still a, a dilute flow. Uh, 
both argon and the solids are injected with a uniform velocity. And mm, the fact is that uh, uh, in other literature, I found that for the simulation of uh, uh, the LMD nozzle, I found that uh, they use the uh, uniform velocity inlet, both for the solids and the gas, that uh, um, delivers the material to the surface. The hypothesis that of the laminar flow, which is uh, confirmed by uh, the, the paper I'm citing, in the sense that in these length scales and in, it is in this uh, slide uh, size scales, both for the pipe and the particles, uh, the particles tend to laminarize the flow, so they prevent the formation of turbulence in this scale. And uh, you might notice that the mesh is relatively coarse, in the and the problem is that the cells must be must be bigger than the particles. So I am um, doing an unresolved uh, simulation. If the if the mesh cells would be smaller, it would be a resolved simulation with a um, a different type of formulation and a, a much greater um, computational cost. And you can see on the bottom also, I cited the total time of the simulation, 0 0.1, 0 0.05 seconds through the pipe. I wanted to uh, give you also some information on the uh, values that I used for the DEM model. Uh, model. As you can see, there are there is a list of values. These values are taken from the paper that is cited in the, at the beginning. It is a gas atomized stainless steel 316L. On the bottom right, you can see the shapes of the particles, which are, they are relatively round, but we, we will be working on understanding how the uh, deviation from the roundness will affect the flow. But for now, we are considering spherical particles. And uh, the stiffness of the particles has been reduced to, to 2.1 times 10 to the 7 Pascal, starting from 10 times from uh, 2.1 times 10 times 10 to the 11 Pascal. So there is a very big reduction in stiffness, which paper I'm citing. Uh, however, if there is a cohesion involved, of course, we have to correct the cohesion to account for the, this reduction in stiffness. But for now, it is not um, relevant for this, um, for this work. Here are also the values that I used for the MPPAC model of the particles. For both cases, uh, I want to I want to say I use the same drug model, so you can see that it is a GIDASPO drug model, which is um, which should be appropriate for both uh, dilute and dispersed phase uh, situations. Here, I wanted to go through uh, some resulting flow characteristics, so some outcomes of this simulation. And uh, for, for the CFD DEM simulation, I can see uh, that uh, the simulation itself can display the waves and the concentration, which, uh, which have the name of clustering. So I can see this periodic phenomena, this periodic phenomena develop over the length of the pipe. So you can see that the clustering begins at, at the beginning, the particles are dispersed and then they tend to cluster in a regular fashion after a certain length. And also we can see that the particles are slowing down through the pipe and uh, they reach a, a steady state velocity um, that uh, is lower than the injection velocity. There are some particles that, uh, I don't know if you can see them, there are some points that are above the 10 meters per second injection velocity. And those points, they might appear like there are a lot of points in reality, there are not many compared to the actual number of particles that are being inject injected that are um, superimposed on the around the 10 meter per second uh, velocity. And also that can be explained with the acceleration of the gas flow in the center of the pipe through the formation of the velocity profile. Well, that's it for, for this slide. I don't know if you can see the animation. Maybe it is a bit too slow. The connection maybe is a bit too slow. Can you con confirm that you're actually seeing the animation? Okay, thank you. 
Okay, from this animation, what I wanted to highlight is the fact that the uh, um, steady state vel velocity of the particles is actually stable through time. So it, this is a, a small snippet of time of the simulation. So the uh, steady state flow is uh, stable. They, they don't deviate. There is a deceleration uh, length of the, of the pipe. And the actual clustering of the particles, the waves in this concentration, are actually uh, moving with the flow. Uh, I forgot to mention that uh, in both graphs, the X axis is a uh, location Z, which is the entire length of the pipe. So the pipe you see on the top, and you can see the clustering and, um, and the particles. In the bottom, you see the entire length of the pipe, and the histogram displays how many particles are in each slice. I could have uh, translated that in con into concentration, but for now it is just a number of particles in the slice. And on the bottom right is also the entire length of the pipe and you have the velocity. And each point is a particle. Uh, analyzing the results, I can see that the exiting um, characteristics of the, of the flow, uh, I, can, I see that, the, okay, there we go. The exiting characteristics of, of the flow can display these oscillations in the number of particles that are ejected. Uh, in red, um, pay attention to the line in red because that is the filtered uh, information in the sense that the particles are exiting uh, and being deleted at the outlet boundary in, an in a sort of an irregular way. So there is a, a bit of noise in the measurement, but with just a small amount of filtering you can see the red line. And this oscillation in the solids flow concentration is actually compatible with the um, size thing before. Okay, the delay is increasing. Okay. In the next slide, uh, I wanted to uh, assess the um, pressure that is present inside the, inside the pipe. Uh, in this case, it is the inlet pressure, so the pressure that is needed to push the particles through the pipe, and you can see that there is still some noise, which is something that I, I might want to address, probably. But uh, in this case as well, just for uh, with a limited amount of filtering, I can extract a signal that is uh, displaying what I can expect in the physical sense. So you can see that there is an increase in pressure in the first phase, and then there is a stationary, stationary pressure after some time. Uh, in the sense that uh, the, the the transport pressure is lower for the pure gas phase, and then it is higher for the particle gas mixture. I can assume a steady state pressure for a time greater than 0 0.02 seconds. In the next slide, also, I'm uh, assessing the pressure. In this case, is through the length of the pipe, and it is a time average between uh, 0 0.04 and 0 0.05 seconds. And you can see that in this case as well, I, I can see something that has a physical sense. So the um, pressure is uh, decreasing non-linearly from the inlet to, the, uh, to a certain length of the pipe. And after a certain length of pipe, I can see that there is a linear behavior of the pressure. So I can safely assume that uh, after 0 0.03 meters, I can also find a steady state situation for the motion of the particles. This has been uh, confirmed with a longer simulation in the sense that the simulation has been longer both in time and in length. And here I wanted to compare the solids flow rate between two different velocities and two different uh, flow rates of the particles. So uh, I wanted to keep constant the concentration of particles at the, in, uh, at the inlet, basically, that is the idea. So the particles are either 300,000 particles a second injected at 10 meters a second, which gives an average of 1.25 grams per second, or the half of that. Uh, as you can see, uh, the average is more or less half. So the, av the average transport is actually reflecting what I'm injecting, which is expected and the uh, uh, rms of the noise signal uh, taken after 0 0.02 seconds displays the amount the amplitude of the oscillations and this rms signal can be com uh, compared with the 
uh, roughness of the material if we want uh, in a more broader sense. But this, in this case, it, it is actually how um, wide these oscillations are, how intense they can be. And, and you can see there are around 20% of the average value of the transport. At this point, we have a question in the sense that in this presentation, I was talking both about uh, CFD, DM, and then PPAC. And uh, we want to see where that went. And here, on the next slide, here um, we can see what the problem might be. In the sense that uh, when using PPAC, we can see that we lose, we, we change the behavior of the particles in quite, a, in quite an intense way. So, so we don't have a, um, an, a mistake in the evaluation of, of the flow rate of the solids. So we can, we can safely assume that this, uh, that, that is, uh, is correctly evaluated. However, the RMS of the signal of the, of, of the noise, we, if we want to call it, of the oscillations, uh, is 17, 15% that of the previous case. So uh, we are evaluating flows that are way more regular than what we can assess with a different method. Uh, as you should, uh, as you might might know, like uh, NPPIC is a cheaper method on the computational level, uh, as opposed to CFDDM. CFDDM simulations uh, of this scale took um, around overnight. Instead, NPPIC simulations just took a few minutes. But as you can see, there is a difference in the signal. We we see that we are losing a delay in the um, delivery of the of the particles and the delivery of the solids here as well I see that there is a, a delay in the connection there we go as you can see on on that initial initial phase there is a transient of the delivery of the particles where some particles are being seen that the, that the actual delivery of the part time something that does not really is just the um, time needed for the 10 meters per second to go from the big from the inlet to the to the outlet so that is the, the time we are seeing also i wanted to uh, show you what is happening with the velocities here we can compare the velocities of the two cases on uh, in blue you can see the cfd dm values and you can see the dispersion the values tend to uh, reach that uh, steady state velocity we were mentioning before and the dispersion is actually decreasing. So the particles are converging around that velocity. And uh, instead, what we can see with MPPAC is that the velocity is decreasing very slowly or even not decreasing um, significantly. And the dispersion is instead increasing. So there is a, a widening of the window of velocities of, uh, of MPPAC particles. Instead, there is a, a Maybe MPPIC is able to, to predict the inlet pressure. However, even in this case, we can see two very different uh, um, behaviors. So uh, for the CFDDM case in blue, you can see that there is the what uh, I described before. So there is a linear increase in pressure while the pipe is filling up with particles. And when the pipe is actually fill, filled up with particles, we have a steady state behavior with a quite flat um, behavior. Instead, with MPPAC, the pressure not, not only stays uh, constant for all the simulations, um, as if there were there was not much influence from the particles, but we can see that there is even a slight decrease at the, through the pipe, which might say that the inertia of the particles can maybe aid the flow. But in this case, 
as we can see exactly that um, there is a huge difference in the two behaviors. And here I wanted to um, Here is another animation, so it should take uh, just uh, just a little while. Okay, I see some comments that are saying that uh, you're not hearing me. Is it is that still the case? Hello, is the is the audio is the audio working? I don't have oh no, I have audio. Um, yes, that's the case. We, we the audio was a bit patchy from time to time. It got better, but I think it would be good if you switch off your uh, your camera. Uh, my video okay i think then uh, think how much did you miss or a little bit of extra bandwidth that we that we need to hear you and okay i think we can uh i will finish the presentation camera. then if uh, there is something that you lost uh, uh i mean I'm, I'm basically at the end so if there is something that you lost please uh, please let me know and i can adjust for that we can we can deal with that in the questions um, yes, so please. I think, please just continue with your talk and then we have a lot of time okay. for questions. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I'm basically at the end, so it should be fine. Oh, you are. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like, I mean, I uh, like before, I hope you, you, caught the, uh, you caught a glimpse of that. I was explaining about the difference between MTPAC and the CFDDM and how much these. are differing from each other and experimental validation so we're trying to see which one so which one of the two is actually displaying the more physically correct behavior for this i have to thank the university of trento and professor luigi fracarolo that uh, helped us with uh, with the equipment and um, let us let us do some of our in the investigation in that uh, in the place and here i can show you just uh, an initial Mm, evaluation of what is happening through the flow. So that that is a very mm, what what we can expect from an, from the experimental setup. Yo, thank mm, you very much. You, huh? Yeah, I just wanted to show that there are some there are some uh, oscillations in the concentration of the particles. So I, I am inclined to think that CFDDM can can be more uh, accurate. So Mm, we're working on some cohesive and adhesive particle flows. And just in, in conclusion, um, I can say that CF, couple CFDDM predicts the periodic phenomena, whereas uh, MPPAC does not um, show any clustering, so the periodic phenomena are not captured by MPPAC. The amplitude and period of the flow simulation determined with, CF, with the CFDDM is compatible with the surface irregularities. As I said before, it is not most likely the only effect that is happening, but it is a first step. It is interesting to see that we have something that is near enough to actually affect the surface quality. And uh, to, uh, to conclude, the calibration of MPPAC using CFDDM in this case still results in a loss of information on the process, a loss of information that is excessive for what we want to actually analyze. And with this, I finish my presentation. Thank you for, for your attention. Um, you can find my LinkedIn profile. And if you, if you have any further curiosity, just don't hesitate to contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Yes. We come your way. Um, thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. I just wondered um, what your thoughts were on the mechanism by which the 
periodicity of the flow of the particles might affect the the molten liquid pool and how then that affect um that then might lead to these irregularities like i wondered what you thought the mechanism was well the if I understood correctly, you're asking how the, these flow irregularities can affect the actual surface quality. So how, what is the actual mechanism that is happening in the manufacturing uh, method, right? Uh, the idea here is that um, we are delivering material in an irregular way. And, um, see, and uh, since these irregularities have an amplitude that is uh, um, quite wide, it is a quite wide um, there is a quite wide difference between the minimum quantity delivered and the maximum quantity delivered. And these uh, differences in amplitude can be separated enough in time that the actual machinery can move through the, through the, through the, the position. And this, um, and this movement can, can result in the fact that for some amount of time, I delivered less material, and for some amount of time, I delivered more material, and this can directly um, result in a lower amount of material captured by the molten pool and a higher material, amount of material captured by the same molten pool. So we can see that these amplitudes and these uh, periods are compatible with what we might find on the surface roughness of the part. I, I, I hope I answered your question. Yes, he's, okay. he's nodding. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, any more questions? Okay. Well, I have one. Um, you showed quite some marked differences between the two methods. Can you go to that slide where you showed the time delay? Of, uh, yes. MP, 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 pick and um, BM. This one. This one, yeah. Um, hmm? So if I understand MP pick correctly, then it's using something like a Eulerian description for the um, for the collisions with a granular temperature, mm -hmm. uh, yes. where DM is more like the DNS type of simulation. But right, it's, it's it, yeah, it's a, it's a bit more on that side, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I should be better. Yeah, so the, the, the I mm -hmm. expect the DM to be more correct. Um, but yes. can you explain the the difference? I mean, this is a factor of two. Yeah, in um, in the time delay, and I, I mean I the thing. Is... Some, it's something with the compressibility and the, the change in density. But I just wonder what is your um, my idea my point why, of view. Why is it happening? Like if you can see here on the on the um, on the beginning of the rise of the um, MPPAC curve, you can see that both curves are actually rising together. So there is a, there there are some DM particles arriving at the end of the pipe at the same time, in the sense that this delay, the first part of the delay where both uh, lines are, are, are at zero those are that that is the time needed for the particles traveling at 10 meters per second to reach the end of the pipe the thing is that mppac preserves that velocity so the particles that are, are arriving more or less all at the same time there is no clustering the particles are not slowing down so you can see that the velocity that that the delay necessary for the particles to reach the end of the pipe is more or less um, that of the single particle traveling at 10 meters per second to reach the end of the pipe. Whereas for CFD DM, you can see that the particles are, some particles are arriving at 10 meters per second, but then the bulk of the particles are actually colliding with the walls. There is, there are collisions involved. There is an exchange of energy with the walls and with each other. So most particles actually arrive in the in a cluster or most particles actually arrive with a, with a longer delay which means that the, that the the bulk of the particles actually arrive with a with a slow with with a lower velocity this is actually uh, seen even in the time domain animations like the the ones that i showed before uh, they are just like snippets of the animation it is just like uh, a fully developed flow, but while the flow is developing, you can really see the evolution of the velocity and you can see that there are some particles that are reaching the end of the pipe at 10 meters per second, but then the bulk is reaching the end of the pipe with that lower um, steady state velocity. So there is a real slowing down of the particles that is happening through the pipe. 
so your physical explanation would be that um, the the pick MP pick does not take into account the wall collisions correctly. It, yeah, that that is the idea. Not not only the the wall collision, but it has a um, probably a harder time to take into account um, these um, cumulative effect of collisions. Maybe I I don't have a complete explanation for that. Mm -hmm. I would have to to investigate a bit more, but that might be a first guess. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. So anybody else that did more questions from the audience? Now that you had more time to think. No, that's not the case. And I'll just let me check the, the chat. No, there are no questions there. Okay. Perfect. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. For your, for your talk. Let's talk. Uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again.